Good morning. Let's go ahead and stand and let's start our, our service this morning with a song. And I'm going to open in prayer this morning. And I'm sure we'll have people who will trickle in. You know how Baptists are. And so uh, we'll do it just like that. And uh, let's give God some glory and some praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the many of us that are here this, this, uh, this morning and through Facebook. I pray that you just have your hand upon us this morning as we uh, get some encouragement from your word. I pray that you would help us not only that, but Lord, that we will uh, take the opportunity that we have in this moment to be able to be a, a ministering tool for your glory to those around us. I pray that you would have your hand upon us, Lord, that we uh, minister uh, accordingly and just uh, ask and pray that you would uh, be with us today. Watch over us in our, our minds and our spirits. Pray that you would rest them. The enemy's already tried to show up this morning and cause a little bit of ruckus, but Lord, we're thankful for your protection. We ask and pray that you would move now, lead God and direct us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's worship this morning.
Well, you know, in January, this is the challenge that we have when we come together as a body of Christ. We, uh, we, don't, we don't mean to, but sometimes it's wintry, it's cold sometimes, and you, and you got that post-holiday blues, you know, when all the family's gone, and it's just like, you know, you and the bird feeder, and, and you know, it's just like there's, there's just a lot that you, feel, you just bring it in, and you're just kind of weary and tired. And so there's kind of a tired spirit in here this morning. So we're going to pray one more time. And we're going to ask the Lord for a little boost, a little energy bar boost. And just ask the Lord for a little strength this morning. Because we're together for one, one time out of the week uh, to encourage each other, to fellowship, to uh, and, and just, you know, just find out how we're doing with each other. And so that's an opportunity that we have. Let's don't, let's don't miss out on it this morning. And so, after I pray, they're going to play a little, a little uh, mingle music, right guys? And uh, you guys are going to just go around and bump fist and just give each other a smile. And uh, it maybe, maybe you at, while you're doing that, you can say, hey, at the end of the service, let's stay for like three minutes extra. Let me hear about your week. Just something like that. How about that? Good challenge? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity this morning to be in your house Thank you, Lord, for uh, just the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for uh, seeing those who I know have been struggling throughout the week but are here this morning, uh, encouraged and in, in, in doing the encouraging. I just pray and ask this morning that you would lift us up, strengthen us this morning, allow us to find joy not in our circumstance alone but for who we have living inside of us. Lord, our hope is built on nothing less than the cross and the gospel. We're so thankful, Lord, for what you've done for us. I pray you'd help us, Lord, that we might take the opportunity, uh, Lord, to be a ministering 
tool for your glory in the life of someone else. I pray that you would help us, strengthen us, encourage us, be with the rest of the songs, be with the message this morning. Lord, use it for your glory. Let it encourage our hearts. And I pray and ask that you would bless in all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You give somebody a fist bump, tell them you love them, and we'll come right back. in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Let's find our seat. There we go. That feels a little bit better. I like that. Everybody got a little community. Sure enough. Sure enough. All right. All right, guys. Bring it down, bring it down. All right, let's have our, let's find our seat, and we're going to do some announcements. We're going to roll some real quick, and then after that, I'm going to have uh, A.L. come up and just share a quick testimony. So let's roll those announcements, and let's find out what the Lord's got for us in the near future. church. If this is your first time with us, welcome. Um, after the service, we would love to give you a small gift. So get one of our pastors in the back corner and that way they can kind of talk to you, get to know you a little bit and hand you that gift. If you're joining us online today, we are so thankful that you're with us in a part of the service. If you will, please click the like or subscribe button. That way it always notifies you of what's going on and where we're at. And if you have never joined us before, there's a little button down there for a connection. If you'll click on that and just tell us a little bit about you, that way we get the chance to pray for you and uh, just, to, just know that we're glad that you're a part of this and be a chance for us to love on you and just reach back out to you. So thank you for that.
Covenant believe that giving is an act of worship. There are several ways you can give. You can give through the Tithely app, our website, by mail, or during offering time. Psalm 27:12. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Is it weird seeing you on screen like that? Yeah. You do a great job, though, by the way. Wonderful job. Right on. Okay, so uh, we're getting ready to take up our offerings. So if I could get the uh, ushers, if you'll come on up and uh, get in the place of that. Did um, ushers, sure enough. Did, did uh, somebody go out of town and forgot to pick out our ushers this week? Right on. All right. Well, somebody come grab these plates so we can have that. Hey, I'm going to have you just share a testimony. Just come out here. Yeah. Here you go. Here you go. We got Paxson will do it. Paxson will do one side. Come on, Pax. Nope. He says no. Okay. That's okay. All right. Uh, AL is a part of our Sunday night training class for our uh, disciple making disciples uh, training. And. Uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to have uh, somebody just share a brief testimony of what, uh, what, what the Lord's been doing uh, through that training. So I'm going to let him just take a quick moment and, uh, and share a quick testimony from, uh, from that. Like Scott said, we're all doing the Disciples Making Disciples on uh, Sunday nights. Signed up for the class, and if I can say anything, it's opened my eyes that there's lost people out there that I'm not touching. It's open to me to be more recessive to the Lord's calling of people that walk by you every day. So, a couple of years ago, to give the testimony that he wants to share, or Scott had asked me about sharing, which, thank goodness, he only gave me a few minutes when I come in, because I really get nervous in front of people. As all of you know, I can talk to you individually all day long. <laughs> but anyway, my mother-in-law has a guy that we have staying with him. He's been there for at least seven, eight years. He's a friend of the family over 20 years. Knew that he didn't really know Christ. A couple of years ago, I bought him a Bible and said, here, Steve, read it. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Went on and my heart became burnt when we started this class. Uh, a week before Thanksgiving, I had done several things. And as Fred mentioned, that Marlene had got a card for me to pray for somebody. She prayed. And had several other people I'd asked to pray for me. I went in the day before Thanksgiving, got there late that night. Next morning I got up. You feel God laying on your heart. Let's do this. It's 10 o'clock, put a turkey in the oven. So I said, ah, let's just wait till after lunch. That didn't work. <clears throat> so anyway, we sat down at the table, and I walked in what we describe as the three circles. If you're not familiar with that, I would look it up online. You'll, you'll hear a whole lot more about it over the next few weeks or so. It gives you a graphic picture of the world, gives you a picture of who God is, and gives you the cross, which is the only way you can get back to God because of failure. So we shared that with him. He said, you know, I know of God, but I did not know God. So I explained to him how he could reach back to heaven. Even though he already knew him, he just didn't know how to get to him. So sharing the gospel like that, it's opened my eyes, it's opened my heart, and I know it's opened some of the other people that are taking the class because we're accountable to each other of what we say we'll do each week. That makes a big difference. Again, you can invite people to church all day long. Yes, that works. I've seen it work. But this way, you've got people that God's told you to take a hand on and work with them and disciple them. So that's my Amen. Testimony. Thank you. Thank you, A.L. And uh, is it my understanding that this young man came to Christ? Is that right, A.L.? Yeah, he came to Christ and uh, recognized uh, he was lost without Christ and uh, received Christ. And so A.L. will be praying as A.L. Uh, knows what to do. So um, bottom line is this class teaches you to um, eliminate the middleman of the gospel. And what that means is um, it teaches those who um, you don't have to be an extrovert to do something like this. Um, I know because a lot of our class has a lots of introverts in it. That's okay, but instead of um, instead of inviting them to church, um, you, you you know so they can come and hear the gospel plan of salvation, uh, you are presenting it to them in such a way 
that whether they come to church or not, they're still going to hear the gospel. Um, and uh, it can be a fearful thing. It can be a scary thing. Um, but uh, repetition is your friend. And we've been able to um, teach and train in that area. So uh, just continue to pray for our group on Sunday nights. We'll be meeting tonight at 7 o'clock. We're about uh, 10 weeks into it now. And uh, so if you're interested in doing that, our next session will be coming up. Um, um, shortly after we finish this one, uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll let you know more about that. Uh, ushers, if you'll come, let's go ahead and get ready to take up our offering and uh, give the Lord some praise this morning through our giving, and uh, enjoy that. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would have your hand upon this uh, opportunity now to give. Uh, back to you what Lord belongs to you already. I pray that you would use it for your glory, for your kingdom. Lord, we just ask and pray you give us wisdom uh, in how that looks. I pray that you would just uh, lead God and direct us in all avenues of that. Lord, pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand and let's get ready to sing another song. Give God some glory.
Amen. You can have a seat. If I can get all the young ones to uh, go ahead and be dismissed and get ready. Mr. Drew and Miss Benita are out there waiting on you. C4 group. And uh, I guess, is it time to preach? <laughs> Yay. All right, let's uh, get our Bibles out to 1 Samuel chapter 16 this morning. I'm so excited. I know that seems weird to a lot of people. I get super excited about preaching on Sunday, but it's, 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 I mean, I think about it all the time. So it's just the way God's designed us to operate in our gifts. Isn't that right? You've got gifts that you get excited about uh, exercising, and this happens to be mine. I'm super excited about it. But uh, may I also say this, just since we're talking about it, is uh, your gift that you operate in is no greater or lesser than the op- gift I operate in. Just so you know that. Um, you know, we kind of sometimes get confused uh, thinking that there's one gift that's greater than the other. There's speaking gifts and then there's uh, un- not speaking gifts. And those that are operating their gifts this morning uh, that are not in the forefront. Um, actually, the Bible says that let us give them um, uh, gratitude. And uh, and thank the Lord for them as well because uh, they're just as important. Amen. And so we must remember that. Uh, okay, First Samuel chapter sixteen. We have been in it for um, uh, quite a, quite a while, and we're going to finish up First Samuel uh, the book, uh, and then we'll wait a little while before we go into Second Samuel, uh, and then we're going to hit into some Acts, uh, or actually some got one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, here in the uh, through the spring and the summer, uh, but uh, quite a lot happening. There's a lot of drama in uh, the Old Testament. Am I right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. A lot of messed up families. Uh, a lot of uh, some bad decisions. Uh, but um, you read those and you you kind of you, you you think, man, this this is this is uh, this is horrible. But we can all relate uh, in some way or another. Uh, to some of the things that we see transpiring in the lives of these men and women uh, that God is using. And, uh, you know, he, he uses anything He chooses. He can use anything He chooses. We've seen Him use a donkey. Uh, now, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about an actual donkey. We, we, he, we've seen Him do so many different things through Scripture. And uh, we sit back and be like, what? This is crazy. What a God we serve that He could find uh, glory in, in every area of His creation. So, here we are now uh, in the book of 1 Samuel. We're in chapter 16. Last week, uh, the Lord closes out chapter 15 with this with this uh, n- name. He says, I am the glory of Israel. That's the only time you see that in the scriptures. He says, I am the glory of Israel. Why did he say that? Uh, well, because the first king that the, uh, of, of God's people, of God's chosen people of the Israelites, was a glory hog. He was the one that was, was erecting statues and, and things in his honor and his name. Uh, last week we talked about God gave him a direct command and Saul disobeyed the command and then turns and looks at God's man Samuel and says, I did what you told me to do. And standing just a few feet away is the king he was supposed to eliminate right there in front of him. But that's what sin does to us. It creates in us a blindness that allows us to see what we want to see and not the reality of what is truly transpiring. And we call right wrong and wrong right. And that's just the backwards of, of, this, of this sin a disease that is carried down from 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 generation to generation. Y'all have heard of the backward rhyme, right? You know that one. My papa used to say it to me all the time. It's one bright morning in the middle of the night. Two dead boys got up to fight. Back to back, they faced each other, drew their swords, and shot each other. The deaf policeman heard the noise, came out and shot the two dead boys. If you don't believe this lie is true, ask the blind man. He saw it too. That is where we are living right now. 
everywhere we look. And we find it here. It's not new. It's not a, a new thing just because we happen to be existing in this time of our life. It was happening in Samuel's day. It was happening at the beginning of this, uh, this newly designed uh, people, uh, tribe of the Israelites. And so there, it, this morning we're going to look at uh, several different things. This is kind of two sermons wrapped into one, but we're only going to be looking at two verses uh, this morning because there's a lot of meat that we need, to, um, uh, we need to address. There's a lot of things to unpack in this verse. And, uh, and so we look at it here in 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord says to Samuel, now remember... Everybody look here. Let me give you the, let me lay the groundwork here. Samuel is the voice of uh, peace for the Lord, for the children of Israel. Samuel was used to handpick the king, the first king of Israel, King Saul. Saul started out humble. He was so humble he didn't even want to be recognized. He was hiding in the luggage. Now at the end of his of his reign, he is building statues in his name while being disobedient straight to the voice and to the face of God. He's just lying right to his face. And so last week we talked about that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Uh, you can go back and watch the video, read the chapter for yourself. It's all very self-explanatory. And God says, I am the glory of Israel, even though the Israelite picked Saul to be the first king, I am still in control. And so here we are now, Samuel who has labored, he has been weary, he has toiled, he has tried, he has wept, he has, he has you know, been accused and feared for his own life. Uh, by the people of Israel, he's had to work things out in a communication way so that the people would understand that, look, if this turns out to be bad, I didn't pick this guy, you did. He had all kinds of things he was juggling. He was laboring, he was weeping, he was uh, enduring, he was staying up late at night, crying out to the Lord on the Lord's behalf because it grieved God's heart and it grieved him. And here it is in chapter 1 of 16, God tells Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? Grief is an animal all to its own. It's, it's so divisive that the Lord has given an opportunity for our, us to have a, our own ministry um, during the week that has been able to help lots of people in our community who hear about it and are even calling even today, when is the next one start? I want in. It is a universal language that everybody in the whole wide world knows grief. Saul was the, the one thing that Samuel was hoping you know that that one thing. It was almost kind of like um, it would be kind of like the equivalent of watching somebody who is a believer uh, fall in love with an unbeliever, does not know Christ, hoping for the experience of watching them come to Christ, but waiting until after the marriage. It's a scary thing. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But Samuel was toiling in such a way that I'm gonna, we're going to select him to be king. The Lord has selected you to be king. And I'm going to do everything I can to make this work out for you. Samuel was there. He was alongside of Saul every step of the way. He was, he was pleading with Saul. He was begging with Saul. He said, Saul, just obey. Saul, just do what you're told. Just follow the Lord. Turn your heart back to Him. Be obedient to what He tells you to do. When He tells you to do this, do it. And do it exactly the way He says to do it. Because partial obedience is still disobedience. Samuel was weeping. We saw that in the last chapter. Chapter 15, verse 11. The Lord said, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry. You know that person you love so much? 
that they just make you want to just choke hold their face to the ground. And it, and they're ang they're, you're you're so you're so done. You're angry. You weep over them. Why? Because not only have they broken your heart, but they have broken the heart of God. And that's where Samuel's at right here. He is he has been the the mouthpiece for the Lord. He has done all the legwork. And here it is at the end, and it looks like all of Samuel's toil, all of Samuel's trial. All of Samuel's endurance, all of Samuel's obedience in spite of the weeping and the, the exhaustion, getting up the next day, being up all night, getting 30 minutes of sleep, maybe. It's coming to a, a halt. And Samuel is looking at it just like you and I would. Samuel was a man. Samuel was human. Samuel wanted Saul to succeed, but Samuel was not going to succeed. Or Saul was not going to succeed. Saul was an utter failure. And in some ways, I'm sure Samuel felt like, if only there was something I could have said differently. Only if there's something I could have... Samuel wasn't grieving the dead, church. He was grieving the living. And so we know a little bit about that in some of our own lives, through loved ones, through co-workers, through... People in our life that, that we are we are we have been handpicked by the Lord to to walk with and and even though it does not turn out the way we hoped, you still wonder like what in the world did you even ask me to do this for if this is how it's gonna turn out? I've asked that a lot. What in the world was the purpose? And so you have to understand when God says, Samuel, how long will you grieve over this person in your life? God was saying, although I grieve too, you and I don't grieve the same. But I'm going to say, I regret making Saul king. See the difference between a sovereign God who grieves over a decision that is made is that he knows the outcome. We have to handle it as it transpires. And it's a shock. And it can, it can rip you in, t in two. How long, Samuel, will you grieve over Saul? And here's the, here's the thing that the Lord has taught me through grief. When we grieve as a child of God, it is with the understanding that God is sovereign. And that all that has transpired was not designed to harm me. That is the separation of a child of God who grieves with the truths and the promises cemented in their heart knowing that God is in control no matter what comes your way. I mean, honestly, how arrogant can we be to think that because we are now a part of the kingdom of God and God's child that, that we are supposed to be treated better than his own son was. When we go through suffering, we complain about it, and we whine about it, and we get mad at God about it, when all the while He's using what already was going to happen to us in the broken state that we live in, but because of His Son, because He gave His Son, we have hope. And He uses these sufferings that we are dealing with every single day of our life with the understanding that God is sovereign. He's using those things to make us more of a reflection of Christ Jesus. So we think because we have to go through the suffering and the grieving and loss of life and those that we love and, and the bearing of the loved one and, and watching those turn their back on God and all the things that hurt, we get lied to by the enemy. The enemy will use grief to separate you and I from the will of God and His direction. He uses it as a tool to separate. 
So if you are in here this morning and you're grieving those that are in your life right now that are just, just not obeying. Or you are in here this morning and you're grieving still the freshness of a loved one that you've had to, to bury. Uh, the enemy will use these things to distract and detour you from God's will in your life because you still have purpose. When our son died and we buried him, we were 27 years old, married. Six years. A long time ago, it seems like. And I remember carrying his little casket. Could have done it all by myself. Put it on my shoulder. And lower him into the earth. To see him no more on this side of glory. The grief... The unbearable hurt of watching that happen and to think this isn't real, this isn't happening to me, this is not, this is just a, a bad dream. Only to realize that is everything of it is real, everything is happening, it is reality and you've got to face it or else. And the first instinctual thing that takes place in our sinful nature is to do this. You, look what you did to me. People are dying and killing their babies and they're doing all these things. I want to raise mine and you take my son? Those conversations happen, whether it's a spouse that passes, whether it's a child that passes. It's just being real with God. He already knows your heart. You might as well go ahead and just not fake the funk. But then uh, as you hear yourself speaking to the creator of the universe, such as that... That thing in you that was birthed in you through the work of the cross, the hope that is in me, I realize there's more to this story. I realize that that grief will still be grief and I realize that there's anger and I realize that there's seclusion and isolation and all the steps that go forth in that process but the enemy was doing all he could all he could to to separate us as a couple and to rip us from the will of God in his direction and he's doing it to you he's doing it to you listening online or whatever and we had to come together and we had to decide it, either this is it and we're done or we're going to double down and we're going to just trust that God knows better. And I would love to tell you, love to tell you, Bob, that we walk through it with, with such uh, amazing strength and grace. Bro, I was on the horn with everybody I knew that was a believer. Just, dude, what do I do next? What do, how do I handle my wife? She, she won't stop crying. He said, look, when she weeps, you weep. When she cries, you cry. You hold her. You don't need to say a word. Just be there. It's the best advice I ever got. Why? How? What? These mind-bending questions that, that saturate your heart and life. How long are you going to grieve Saul? Was the question. Why? Because there's a time to grieve. And then there's a time to mourn. And then there's a time... To be joyous. There's a time to move forward. There's a time to put it down and say let's continue on. We're not leaving anybody behind. We're moving forward in the name of Jesus. That takes a while to get to that place. 
the pain and the sorrow and mind-bending questions will take over our thoughts and lies will seem like truth. Saul, disobedient. Samuel, losing sleep, begging God, Let's, let me just go in there and try one more time to convince him to turn his mind back to you. And, and w there's nothing we can do to control it. And then we lose that, that situation. is completely out of our hands. And then the pain, the sorrow, the questions, they take over. And uh, I remember in our, our singular situation... In our grieving, the Lord's grace was around us. God was on top of us. He was underneath us. He was beside us. He was everywhere. We were just, we didn't know what to do. We were just taking one day at a time, one step at a time. We didn't have grief share. Well, that would have been amazing. It took us 20 years to do that after the fact. But it, it, and it helped us, and we thank the Lord for it. But we didn't know. And so when you're not... In the midst of your grief, with God's word and his truth and his promises, looking back at you, if that's not looking back at you, something else is. And it's lies. It's the enemy. You could have done a better job. You could have avoided. This is all your fault. What kind of person are you? You're not even a real Christian. You are fake. That person was right. You are, a, you are the worst for them. No, those are all lies. But guess what? You're so, you're so in a state of grief. Samuel was in such a state of grief that the Lord, the God who created Samuel, asked him a question that he already knows the answer to. How long are you going to grieve over this man? I have taken his throne. It has been ripped away. And the Lord tells Samuel, it's time to move forward. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we see a powerful verse that will help you in every situation, not just grief. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ Jesus. Being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is matured. And complete. Let me tell you one of the one of the lies the enemy tells me, and and he's been telling me this almost every Sunday for the last 25, 26 years. What you're about to say, they've already heard it. You're you're the worst. Just don't preach this morning because you're boring and you stink as a preacher. I hear it every Sunday in my head. Every time. So I have to get together with the Lord. And we got to have a little powwow. And he's got to remind me. And then I have to take that thought. And I basically just grab it wherever it's at. And I crumble it up. And I drop kick it. And get it out of my life. And say so you know what? I can't believe that. I can't believe that all that God's allowed me to suffer through and endure and go through and live through and experience and minister, that he's going to just come up to me and say, you know what, you suck. I'm going to get somebody else. You don't, you know, you're no good. No, that is a lie from the enemy. And he's telling you the same thing about maybe your age. I'm too old to do this. Or I can't do this. Or I'm just going to retire from the, from, the, you know, from the kingdom of God. I'm just going to sit back and, and do this. And, or I, I'm not good enough. Or I can't say it just like this. Or I can't talk just like this. And we start to sound like Moses. And we start to sound like all these excuses we see that have all been given. There's nothing new under the sun. And you got to take it captive. Every thought. Take every thought captive. 
to the obedience of Christ. Meaning everything that comes through this old noggin here, I've got to match it up with God's truths and God's word. And if it doesn't match, I throw it out. And so here we are, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. How long will you grieve over Saul since I've rejected him from being king over Israel? And then God gives him a command, an action, a call to action. God tells Samuel, fill your horn with oil and go. Woohoo! Fill my oil. Fill my cup. Fill my horn. Let me get some of that. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, pumped up, excited. Well, what's this supposed to mean? There's a horn and an oil and where am I supposed to go? Taco Bell? What's going on here? Fill your horn. We see in Scripture, it says the horn in the Word of God is a symbol of victory. Okay, I can get down with that. I'm supposed to grab on to the victory that is in Christ Jesus and let me, let me flourish in, in what He's already, uh, already won on the cross. And the oil is a picture of the anointing of God. That is amazing. I've got, now I've got a horn that is a symbol of victory. And I've got oil in this horn that is a, the anointing of God. And, and, and we could take that. And Sam is like, yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow the victory that's already been won uh, in the gospel of Christ. And I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to, to operate in me and to move me in the direction I need to go. And that is awesome. And we are all to have the heart of Samuel. We're all to have that mindset. But there's one caveat to this whole story. God tells Samuel, he says, you've sat in a place of grief for far too long. You've labored in a place of defeat no more. Your struggles are no longer a hindrance, but they are now a landmark of my grace. The Lord said, I'm the glory of Israel. I'm the glory of your life. And what we see as blocks and roadblocks and hindrances and deterrents in our life, God uses them as, as memorials of His grace in our life through every storm, through every trial, through every circumstance. God is teaching Samuel this lesson that you and I need to pay attention to. But remember in Scripture when I said that when we study God's Word, we got to make sure that we understand that we're not just studying it to get something for us. We're getting it, we're understanding Scripture so we can know more of the character of God. If we are only searching Scripture to get a nugget for us to carry us through the day, or what's my word for the year, hallelujah, you know, and, and we're, we're missing out on who God is in Scripture. Then we missed it. And this is amazing. Yes, we are to fill our horn with oil. Yes, we are to claim the victory in Christ Jesus. Yes, we are to, to step out and allow the Spirit of God to direct us and to move us and to lead us and guide us. But there's one thing about this story. Fill yourself up with God's Word. Allow His Spirit to lead you, guide you, and direct you today. Yes, we get so excited about filling our horn and experiencing the oil that we forgot our objective. The objective is simply the horn and the oil wasn't for Samuel. It was for the next man up. And that's a sports terminology. Anytime you watch football or basketball and a power player gets hurt, he gets sprained, what's the coach always say? Next man up. Now here we are talking about in a divine sense and a creator of the universe and Saul did not pan out very well so God said now you've chosen a man now I'm going to choose a man personally I'm going to hand pick him and I'm going to anoint him with that oil that's in that horn that I told you to bring with you but this horn and this oil I got to I got to tell you I got excited I was like oh man there's so many directions I can go with this I was so excited yeah this is going to be great I'm going to really I'm really encouraged and challenged but then I got to thinking wait wait a minute wait a minute Samuel did all that he did, but this horn, this oil wasn't for Samuel. It was for David, the true king of Israel. Samuel feared. Samuel was the one that stayed up at night and wept. He obeyed God still. Samuel cried all night, the Bible said in 15 verse 11. 
Samuel continued to obey in spite of his tears. Samuel worked, labored, sweat, kind of like I'm doing right now in this hot sweater that I wish I wouldn't have worn. <laughs> but he sweat, he worked his behind off, he struggled, he did everything that he was supposed to do. He filled the horn with oil. Samuel still questioned God. And here's the whole thing of this, these first two verses that we see in Scripture. All that we see Samuel doing was for someone else. And we got to learn to be okay with that. Samuel labored, but David received the increase. But we got to remember that Samuel was Samuel. Samuel was God's anointed man for the children of Israel. But Samuel wasn't so proud that he wasn't the one that was doing some work behind the scenes. And nobody was seeing him do all this. And nobody saw him staying up at night weeping over the heart of a, a, a bad king. And, and Samuel did all of this. And God tells Samuel... In his grieving state, mind you, get your horn, fill it with oil. I've chosen a man. Now, I love a good love story. Right? You like a good love story? Now, I'm not talking about let's go out and watch, you know, the notebook together or nothing. But <laughs> there was a woman, a Gentile woman now, remind you, who was a harlot, a woman of the night. Now, I don't know the definition of what all that entails, and it might not actually be what we think that looks like today, but she was a second, not even a second class. She was like a fifth class citizen. Looked down like worse than a dog. Her name was Rahab. They called her Rahab the harlot. And this Gentile woman that had no history of followers of God, she decided she was going to turn her heart back to the Lord and gave her heart and life to God as the one creator. And this woman has a child. And she falls in love. Rahab does. And uh, she marries uh and she has a son named Boaz. Boaz falls in love with Ruth. And we all know the cool story between Boaz and Ruth. And they had a son named Obed. You know, it is what it is. But that was his name. Obed has a son named Jesse. And Jesse has eight sons. And one of his sons, the youngest, he was actually a ginger. Where's Hunter at? He had red hair. Beautiful young man. Kind of like you, man. I'm going to give you some props. And he was the youngest. And he was kind of, the Bible said he was reddish hair. And his name was David. And from the lineage of Rahab the harlot and her obedience to the Lord to, to save God's people, she falls in love, Ruth and Boaz. David becomes the grandson of Ruth and Boaz. And God chooses this man who we're going to look at next as the anointed, God-fearing king of Israel. And next week we're going to look at how this selection takes place. And we're going to look at another characteristic of who God is and how he chooses a person. But all that we see Samuel labor in was not for Samuel. It was for someone else. And I propose to you as a body of Christ, we need to have a heart like Samuel. I wrote this down um, this morning just as a way of closing. We need to get to a place of service. Listen to me. In our hearts that we... Even though as flamboyant and charismatic as our personality may be, we can have a place in ourselves 
where we are behind the scenes and we just shut up and serve God for someone else's purpose and for His glory. Samuel was the epitome of that kind of leader. There was a time when he was the one receiving the oil and the horn. And then there was a time when he was distributing the horn and the oil. And I think it would be unfair of us to, to miss out on this particular truth of God's word. I want a desire. I, I beg the Lord. Study God's word to know who he is. He draws that in us as a child of God. He wants that communication. He wants that. Don't just memorize a verse to memorize it or say, look, I read through the Bible in a year. That's wonderful. Who is God? What is His characteristics? How does God's mind work? How does His heart, how, what are His ways? Even though we might not understand them, He will give us over time and 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 with the Lord and the Holy Spirit drawing us closer to Him, He will show you things that you would not believe about who He is. That we, were, we are missing out on because we're just trying to get the horn and the oil instead of finding out a little bit further who He is in our life. Now, that oil is that anointing Holy Spirit which we all get the Holy Spirit in our life when we receive Christ. And we want to make sure that we understand that. The, uh, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit at salvation. But there's an indwelling that comes when we are obedient to the Holy Spirit each and every day. So I encourage you. I challenge you. I, I, I want us to find in the life of Samuel and his grief that it was there is a stopping point. Where we need to put aside our grief and move forward and say, Okay, Lord, your will be done, not mine. He, so apparently, according to verse 1, there is a place and a time for grieving and mourning. And then there's a time where we need to step up and say, Okay, God, what's my next job? What's my next purpose? And I think that's something we need to all understand and make sure that we recognize that. This is just the first two verses of 1 Samuel chapter 16. But there's more to that story that we'll look at next week. I know this is a little bit different on how we close out. But let me have the worship team back up here. And let's close out this morning with this. Let's stand to our feet. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to sing this, this song as we close out this morning. A little bit different of a challenge. This is to the believer this morning. This is not a call to salvation this morning by any means. This is a, this is a call to obedience as a child of God. Where are you this morning if you are struggling with a loved one? If you're struggling with uh, a choice that's been made uh, that doesn't line up with God's Word? Uh, there is a protocol of which you as a child of God uh, need to follow and it's, and it's called His Word. And there's things that you can do to make it worse. But the way we can avoid making it worse in our grieving and our state that we're in is listening to the voice of the Lord and saying, Lord, give me my next task. Let me know what it is. I, I'm enjoying the horn. I'm enjoying the oil. But at the same time, if it's not for you, it's for someone else. The best way to help your grief for me it was and my wife was that we started ministering to others. We started being others focused and we started to find out that uh, there was a healing and there was a joy in ministering to those that were grieving because we were able to use that as a tool. So let's sing this song. Is What's this song called? Just as, Just as I Am. And then there's a new chorus at the end, so stick along and follow along Micah with it. And let's worship the Lord this morning and give Him some, some praise and some glory uh, through this song.
I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God just as I am. Praise God just as I am. Amen. I hope that was a help to you this morning, encouragement from the Word of God this morning. And uh, we will uh, continue next week. So here's my encouragement to you, my challenge to you this week as you, uh, as you take what you've heard. Uh, our responsibility, whether you're a teenager going to school or you're a grandparent uh, operating in your neighborhoods and uh, wherever it is that we go, uh, let's let's uh, let's recognize. Let's ask the Holy Spirit this week to re- help us recognize the moments and opportunities uh, to to love on someone this week, to to challenge ourselves to step out a little bit farther, uh, and maybe maybe it's somebody you already know, maybe it's somebody that uh, is already in your uh, social group that uh, you you need to take an opportunity this week to uh, to step out and just uh, say, hey, how are you doing? And then don't walk away, but listen to them. Take some time to listen to their heart this week and let them just just share. And be amazed at the opportunities that can come from that question. How are you? And just let the Holy Spirit do the rest because He will do the rest. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, this week, watch over us as we go out. And uh, give us wisdom and discernment. I pray that you would touch and strengthen. Be with all those that are out this week uh, with traveling and sickness. And just pray and ask that you would uh, help them as they uh, uh, get back uh, encouraged and, and, and be back with us, Lord. Just watch over us. Thank you so much for your word. pray you bless the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Real quick, if you are, if you have a child who is a teenager and they plan on going on the winter retreat, um, I have paperwork for you to sign for them to go. So make sure that you see me if you haven't already gotten that. God bless you. We'll see you next week.